Good afternoon to those of you who have joined already. Um, we're going to give folks a few more minutes. Uh, uh, and we'll get started just a minute or two after one. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lynette Beery, the Strategic Director for Zero to Thrive at Michigan Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, Zero to Thrive is an organization that uh, works to promote the health and resilience of families from pregnancy through early childhood with research, education, partnership, and service. We're really happy to have you join us today uh, for what is uh, uh, the uh, conversation of our times, uh, thriving childcare, ensuring young children's well-being and health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, let's go over a few housekeeping items and then I will introduce the panelists and we'll get going. Um, you are in listen-only mode, um, so you will not be able to um, ask a question verbally. You can feel free to ask questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, the slide says chat box, but please use the Q&A uh, to ask your questions. Um, and we will, to the best, excuse me, the best of our ability, um, answer questions that are asked live. We have had quite a few questions that were shared with us in advance of the webinar as well that uh, we will be uh, using to frame the conversation today. As you just heard, if you were on already a few minutes ago, we are recording this webinar and it will be available at zerotothrive.org and we will be sending that uh, link out to all participants. So. Don't worry if you don't have a piece of paper to write that down on right this moment. It is my honor to introduce to you our four panelists today. Um, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Kate Rosenblum. Um, and I want to note that I'm going to give you very brief introductory introductions of our panelists. They're all very esteemed. Um, and in the interest of time, we're not going to go through a full um, bio on each of them. So back to Dr. Rosenblum. She is the co-director of Zero to Thrive and a full professor at Michigan Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, Dr. Andy Hashikawa is an associate professor at Michigan Medicine in the Department of Pediatric Emergency Medicine. We have with us Dr. Prachi Shaw, also an associate professor at Michigan Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics and Developmental Behavioral Peds. And Mr. Mark Jansen, who is the Director of Child Care Licensing Division in LARA, or the Licensing and Regulatory Affairs Department. If you are interested in their full bios, those are available at Michigan Medicine, and there will be a link at Zero to Thrive. So to get us started today, I thought we would start uh, uh, with you, Mark, uh, to give us just a brief overview of the recent uh, executive orders of 2020, 160, 161, and 164, uh, to sort of just help us understand uh, what we need to be doing for our young friends. 
All right. Um, so the chart on the screen um, is the newest executive order, and it's in our guidelines to um, keeping your child care open, or uh, you'll find reopening guidelines on our website. And this was worked on through um, the governor's office and a number of other folks. And so the masks are a big question right now. And so um, most current executive order talks about when, what environment, who should be wearing um, the mask, whether it's required or just encouraged, strongly encouraged. Um, so that's one. The second um, piece from the EOs would be the COVID response plans. Again, that's in our reopening guidelines, but um, each provider needs to have a COVID response plan. Uh, the third thing would be um, uh, training for their employees. That's another requirement that's in the process. Um, and then monitoring the staff. So as staff come into their facility, uh, they should be checking temperatures and there's a whole process that's involved with that as well. So that's again in our reopening guidelines on our website at uh, Lara for Child Care. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, Prachi, would you like to share with us uh, just some uh, uh, introductory comments about how the developmental tasks of the young children, maybe especially the younger ones, the two and three year olds, impacts their wearing masks? Yes, thank you so much, Lynette, and thanks so much um, to my um, co-panelists for this opportunity. Um, I think the developmental stage of two to five-year-olds or our preschoolers is a really precious developmental time point in child development. Um, in this cognitive development stage, this Piagetian stage of the pre-operational child, children are really able to comply with mask wearing because they are used to, their developmental stage is really about rules. They are, they see the world in very like black and white, um, right and wrong. There's really not much of a gray zone with the pre-operational child. And they really understand this idea of, you know, following the rules, this is right and this is wrong. And they understand concepts of safety. So every child from the minute they have left the hospital as a newborn, has been buckled up in a car seat and they understand the idea of wearing seat belts because this is about being safe. And so they understand how they have to make choices and engage in certain behaviors for the purpose of staying safe. They didn't get to childcare without buckling their seat belts in their car seat. So they understand that we do things um, to be safe and, the, and that there are certain non-negotiables. You know, this is in that right and wrong, black and white, we do things because of being safe and, and sort of in that sort of safety framework of the pre-operational child, um, they really have this idea of, yes, we can do this because this is about being safe. Also developmentally, they are at this um, psychological stage of wanting autonomy, of wanting to be in control, wanting to be the big girl, be the big boy, be in control. And they like to be also, you know, sort of like the little, um, policeman, the little enforcer of the rules saying, oh, you're not, you're not following the rules. That's not right. Or you're following the rules. And so they like to be part of this um, uh, community that enforces, you know, sort of the collective good of being safe and making choices that enforce sort of this collective safety. And I think that opportunity to, um, to have a sense of agency, to have a sense of locus of control, to have a sense of choice and um, exert their autonomy uh, to, to um, foster safety is something that is important in building a young person's self-esteem and a sense of resilience. And especially when um, these behaviors are modeled in a loving, consistent, warm, safe space, that also reinforces the sense of resilience and ability to, um, to, um, to follow along and, and exercise compliance in, in, in the sphere of safety and, you know, and, and child well-being. Thank you, Praji. That's uh, really helpful. And I love the comparison to using a car seat to what we have to do these days to keep everyone safe. Um, okay, Kate, how about some approaches uh, or techniques, maybe even some resources that will assist the teachers in their efforts uh, to continue working on uh, in, uh, enhancing children's social emotional growth um, and uh, young children's resilience? 
Well, good afternoon. Thanks, Lynette. And thanks to the co-presenters, but most of all, thanks to all the people who are here listening today for the work that you're doing and the support that you're giving uh, young kids across our state right now. Um, it's more important than ever. And I'm really uh, grateful to be able to offer some thoughts and hope that this will be an ongoing dialogue. I do uh, think, Prachi, what you shared is just wonderful. Little kids can do this. Um, they can't do it perfectly, but perfect doesn't have to be sort of the enemy of the good, right? We can really work to help little kids be helpers. And they're helping other people by keeping other people safe and wearing a mask. And so when we think about how we want to approach this, I think there are a couple of things that I like to hold in mind. The first is that kids need child-friendly explanations. They need simple words um, and ways of thinking about why are we wearing these masks? Like, what is this about? You know, why are we doing this? Um, they need time to uh, adjust, to adapt, to sort of think about, you know, looking around, seeing what's different, what's the same, um, and getting used to these new routines. They need opportunities to have some mastery, to sort of play it out. That's one of the ways that kids do everything. I don't think I need to tell this, this group um, how important play is, but this is a great time to have toy masks everywhere, um, to put them on the teddy bear, to put them you know, on dolls, to take them off, to play sort of you know, all sorts of games at home and at school with masks to get really comfortable, maybe decorating some, drawing some. And then for us to be curious, you know, sort of be sort of wondering about what is it that kids are thinking and feeling. So we want to both be curious about why do you think we're wearing masks? What do you think um, why we're doing this? How are you being a helper? Um, and then if there are questions or misconceptions to, to answer or to sort of guide those. And then ultimately to give support. Um, kids need factual, accurate information. Now, doing all of that might come really naturally and easily, but sometimes I find it really helpful to look to resources to find those simple words or ways of talking with young kids. And with that in mind, I wonder, Lynette, will you indulge me in a moment in sharing a video? Um, I, I'll just say something about this. This is a video that comes from Sesame Street and Communities, which is a wonderful resource. If you don't know that resource, it's, it's different than just the Sesame Street website. And it has all kinds of great drawings, activities, things kids can do, um, things that for educators that are helpful to talk about the pandemic, about the virus, about hand washing, about social distancing. Um, I'm gonna share a video with you just to give you a flavor of that. It's not exactly about schools, um, but it's about a, a store reopening, Mr. Hooper's store. And I think it could be a springboard for really wonderful conversation about what's new, what's different, and why, as kids are also thinking about wearing masks at school. So let's just take a minute and watch this. Hi, it's me, Alan from Sesame Street. Today we're going to hear another story about my favorite fairy friend, Abby. Look, says Abby's mom, Hooper's store is open again. Yay! I'm going to pick out my favorite snacks and give my friends a great big fairy hug. <laughs> Can we go right now? Well, we do need some things for the week, so yes, says Abby's mom. But Hooper Store is doing things a little differently to keep everyone healthy. Do you want to practice new safe and fun ways to visit a store? Abby's mom says that first they'll need to wear their masks. Oh, like when I wear my mask to play outside? Yes, to help keep everyone healthy. Only a few people can be in the store at one time. So they'll need to be patient while they wait in line. They'll need to keep their hands to themselves and keep a safe distance from everyone else. About... that far. But how am I supposed to hug my friends when they're all the way over there? For now, they'll need to try saying hello to friends in new ways. They can wave, self-hug, or... Air five! Yes! Don't worry, Mommy. I'll hold the flyer and make sure we follow all of our rules. Visit sesamestreet.org slash caring for more.
All right, so I'll stop there. Hopefully, you, I think that illustrated some of the things that Prachi was saying as well about being sort of a rule follower and how to do that, but in a way that's not scary, as positive and fun for young kids. And empowering. And empowering, because kids really want to be helpers. And this is their chance to actually be helpers, to keep everyone else safe. So they can be superhero helpers um, with their masks, their superhero masks at this time. Thank you for that, Kate. And it, it's nice to know that those resources are out there for folks that weren't already aware. Um, so Andy, let's shift gears a little bit uh, to more the uh, medical health side of things uh, with your expertise. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the health benefits of masks, uh, what the safety issues are, um, particularly for young children, to the extent they'll wear them uh, all day. Uh, is that safe? That seems to be a very common question uh, we've been seeing in advance of the webinar. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for this opportunity. I really know from talking to um, folks throughout the country that this is you know, a really particularly challenging, uncertain time for you know, child care programs, child care owners, child care directors. Um, there's a lot of questions that you face from parents. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things uh, that we don't know. Um, but more than anything, having worked with, you know, child care providers over the, the many years is, I know you guys are uh, very smart. You guys are resilient. You guys think outside the box. And more than anything, you really understand child development, how uh, children work, and you really understand uh, the children's needs. So I know we're in a, in a pandemic and there's a lot of things that we don't know, but there are some things that definitely we do know. One is that you know children can get COVID-19 and that's for sure, and it could be spread from child to child, parent to child, um, adult to child as well. So. Um, and this is really uh, increasing uh, in the United States uh, today. So uh, that's one of the things we know for sure. I think the other thing that's very certain mm -hmm. is that masks do help prevent spread of COVID-19. Uh, initially, you know, we didn't have as much information and some of the guidelines uh, may have differed, but with the evidence that we now have, it's very clear that masks do save lives. Um, uh, both especially for uh, people that may be at higher risks uh, for infection. So masks definitely help. And the third thing I would really say is that, you know, as uh, Dr. Prachi had mentioned that, you know, kids are resilient. I see lots and lots of kids that are in the preschool, three, four, five, six-year-old range, teenagers and, and above that um, really are able to wear masks without any problems. They actually think it's really cool. They love it. They love wearing their uh, different designs and characters, and it can be done. So from a health perspective, you know, children have been wearing masks. Certain subgroups have been wearing masks for a long time, especially if they have cancer, uh, they have congenital heart disease, um, they have cystic fibrosis. So kids often have to wear masks in, in settings and for long periods of time. And for the evidence that we've had, they can do this very successfully without any, uh, without any problems. I do say, you know, the younger they are, especially under the age of two, masks will be difficult, you know, um, especially if they can't take and from a developmental perspective, we know that a one-year-old probably won't be able to wear masks. But I think as we get older, we're in the preschool age room, they can wear masks uh, really well. And I think it's important uh, to remember a couple things uh, in addition. Uh, one is, you know, uh, they look up to you as role models. So if they can see that parents and child care program uh, teachers and preschool teachers can wear these masks, that goes a long way. And the second thing I would say is, you know, masks are uh, one piece of the, uh, the solution. Um, there are many other things that are important to remember. So masks are not the end all to solve this problem. We're gonna be having to do hand washing and teach children how to hand wash. Uh, older kids can learn how to, you know, practice hand uh, or hand hygiene, you know, learning to sneeze or cough in the elbows, things. These things need to be taught. Not, we're not born with that. 
Uh, and finally, you know, things that you do already, you know, screening for temperatures, making sure kids who are sick stay at home. And, you know, in the years past, we may not have been as uh, stringent or diligent, but, you know, these are different, definitely different times. And in knowing that, you know, the child care centers program sometimes get forgotten in all the, you know, the national story, but we know that many child care programs are businesses, you guys are struggling, and anything that we can do to keep your environment open environment safe and safe for children is something that we want to work together. So um, at the end of the day, we are all working together. We want to do what's best for you guys. We want to do what's best for um, children in general. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, that's a lovely sentiment to uh, end your comments on. Um, while we're uh, with you, there are some questions in the Q&A about the face shields and uh, when and if those are ever uh, useful or appropriate. So Andy, could you comment on that a bit? Sure. You know, um, face shields currently, you know, according to the CDC recommendations, aren't uh, uh, the best substitute for masks, right? Masks are still shown to be the, the best at uh, preventing spread. The CDC does re recommend face shields for certain uh, exceptions, including if your uh, child is deaf or hard of hearing and really need to be able to see your, uh, your face. Um, obviously, if there are certain uh, particular situations when you do have kids with special needs, and especially if you are a little bit physical distancing, those uh, types of situations may be really a, important to do that. But again, currently they are not a, a great substitute for masks. And so I still would recommend masks as your front line uh, for spreading, uh, uh, preventing spread of COVID-19. Great, thank you. Um, Prachi, there's some comments and questions about um, little one's language development and adults in masks and, and others in masks and, um, and uh, even, you know, reading facial expressions. Uh, what would you as a developmental pediatrician say to us about that? So I, I think there's a, a saying that goes, there's faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is flexibility. And so I think it's really important to um, understand that one size doesn't fit all, including for masks, but that we really have to individualize our expectations based on the child and, you know, based on the child's developmental age and based on their developmental abilities. Um, and so for children who do have um, language delays, whether that's a receptive um, language, do they understand? Are they at a developmental age where they can understand why they're wearing a mask? Um, and expressive language, you know, can they communicate sort of their needs? And so I think it's going to be really um, important for the sensitivity and the um, of the child care provider to understand what that child's individual needs are. There are um, masks that have clear panels so that children can see um, other providers' lips and facial expressions. And I think one can weigh whether that is helpful in an, in an individual situation. Um, I think it's also important for us to understand in this developmental period of the preschool age, you know, in addition to developing mastery, the other um, sort of developmental skill is self-regulation. And so the part of the brain that's developing in this time period and which continues to develop throughout childhood and even into adolescence is the frontal, uh, is the prefrontal cortex, what we call like, you know, the breaks, the breaks of the brain. And so we have to understand that um, little kids are starting to develop the myelination of that prefrontal cortex and they're starting to develop the capacity to stop and to listen and to take in information and to respond and um, according to that, to that part of the brain that's being developed. And so they may not have the self-regulation to not touch their face, not take their mask off. And so this sense of um, sensitivity to where children are developmentally is I think part of the, um, it is part of the equation and part of the recipe for how to make um, not, the safe as well as effective for young children and their caregivers. I love that you're pointing that out, um, Prachi, because it, 
it occurs to me, and I think it's really important that we really hope for kids and for teachers that this is a success opportunity that kids can you know feel successful so it's an opportunity to grow and to learn um, and when they are successful in wearing a mask it's something to celebrate that we want to really make this a positive um, experience to the fullest extent possible that kids might feel sometimes worried, they might need reassurance, they might struggle with not putting their hands under or remembering that they have to keep their mask on. And it's an opportunity for us to both help them understand cognitively and also really um, support and celebrate their behavioral successes um, and then redirect, guide and support when they need a little extra help to remember, you know, actually we keep the masks on our face or we keep our hands outside our mask or, you know, things that they are learning um, and having an opportunity to practice through this. And I think also in this time period, this is where peer relationships are really helpful because um, little kids love to be helpers and they like to be helpers to other little kids. And so sometimes even in um, a peer situation, this is where one child can help another child say, oh, wait, the rule is we keep our masks on. Oh, the rule is we keep our hands in our laps and we don't touch our face. And so in a very supportive environment, this is where everyone learns that they are helpers to one another. Yeah, um, and what about kids with sensory issues? Are there anything we should be, folks should be thinking about um, to help children that maybe are on the spectrum or just have some sensory issues and the mask may stimulate some difficult reactions? I think that is such a um, thoughtful and sensitive question. And I think it goes back to that, um, my other, my first comment, which is, this importance of, of flexibility and really understanding um, individual differences, that there are some children who can tolerate mask wearing for longer and some children who may need some breaks from the mask wearing because of their sensory differences. And if there are um, opportunities to sort of desensitize or to, um, to sort of mitigate some of those sensory sensitivities through therapies such as occupational therapy, that can be helpful and that should be employed. And for the children who may just need some sensory breaks because this is um, aversive to them, I think we need to consider how to do that in a way that still keeps them safe and still keeps their, um, their um, companions and their classmates safe. So lots of questions in these regards in the Q&A, but I want to shift gears just for a few minutes. Uh, uh, since we only have an hour and, and go back a little bit to Andy and then Mark, um, get ready because I'm coming back to you in a minute. Uh, so Andy, some questions about, you know, how do we manage the mask to make sure it doesn't become full of germs, right? Uh, if the kids sneeze in it, you know, should that mask then be changed? And so can you just speak a little bit to sort of how to make the mask uh, uh, be the best uh, protector uh, that we know it can be? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think uh, in terms of masks, uh, number one, we know that uh, masks to be comfortable, right? So we wanna make sure that the masks fit appropriately. Um, so each child is gonna have different needs, but we wanna make sure that it fits right where it should be. It's not getting into the eyes, it's not too small or too big. So that's going to be really important. I think from a childcare prov uh, provider perspective, I think uh, working together with parents and you know a lot of community organizations, uh, making sure that the mask is uh, reusable, I think is going to be important, right? Um, because disposable masks, while they're nice, are more expensive. And, and I think um, having something that you can wash at the end of the day, I think it is really important. Um, whether if a kid sneezes once or twice into a mask, I, I think that's gonna be okay. I, um, obviously, if it's really soiled and dirty, you may wanna change that. So maybe having some extra masks, uh, spare masks would be a great idea. But again, I think number one is comfort, making sure it fits and it's comfortable. Number two is making sure that mask is washed at the end of the day would be, would be important. Um, and so uh, making sure parents have at least a couple that they can rotate around. 
are going to be important. And then personalizing those masks, making those masks uh, fun, uh, something cool to wear that's unique, that kind of uh, identifies with them or on a character, uh, all really important uh, to ensure that, you know, they wear the mask as much as possible. We're going to try our best. Yeah, and I think that is an important message, just um, that there's, it's not going to be perfect. I think a few of you have said that so far. Um, and uh, we are just going to try to do the best we can to keep everybody safe with these younger, in these younger age groups and the adults that are caring for them. Um, Mark, can you comment a little bit on you know, some things have, of course, changed since March, right? Uh, uh, we uh, have seen some of the guidance uh, uh, for uh, young children, uh, as well as for adults, uh, changed since March. So could you comment a little bit on, you know, sort of what maybe you said earlier to child care settings um, and versus what you're saying now and perhaps why some of those changes came about? So I think the changes are primarily, um, we're becoming um, a little more of a stickler on the mask, right? Because a mask is now mandatory across the state. And a lot of people are asking, well, um, young children, this, that's why this conversation is so critical here today. Um, you know, so young children are being asked um, that they're going to have to wear these masks. And I think a lot of folks are asking why. And so we're um, in our... Um, reopening guidelines, we call it on our website, we have um, tried to align that document with the executive orders and then the Michigan School Safe Start Plan. Um, so we're trying to make it a little bit easier for the providers to be able to understand so much information coming from CDC, DHHS, all these other places. So I, I think one of the things that we have seen change since it started, we are now coordinating with um, multiple departments. Um, and uh, so when they talk or see our reopening guidelines on our website, that has been coordinated with uh, what I would call uh, dozens of people in the state, if not more than that. Um, so what we're trying to do is make it easier for the providers so that they don't have to cut through all of the red tape, I guess I would call it, because there's so much information out there. So um, I think that would be one piece of it. Um, the mask would be the other piece. And we're starting to get back in the field ourselves as child care consultants. So I have about 90 staff that are going out um, as uh, licensing consultants to all the providers that might be on this phone call today. And they're beginning to um, do their inspections. So they're coming in with PPE. They're coming in with, um, you know, things that uh, they're concerned about with their own family. So. Um, I think providers, um, it would be good for them to know that even my staff have concerns. And so when they can knock on their door, they're wearing um, a mask and they might be doing a few other odds and ends. But um, my sense is, is that everybody's on edge with all of this, not only the providers, not only the children, not only the parents, um, but I think uh, even us in licensing, we're trying to do it right. Like everybody's saying here today, flexibility is so important. Um, health and safety of children, uh, to me, that's what's so beautiful about this call today is you're really focused on uh, the health of the kids, their holistic health. So um, that's, that, that's, you know, we don't have all of the right answers. Um, and so I want the providers to understand that the consultants that license them, that they're human, just talk to them, ask them questions. Many of them are probably watching this today as well. So I would just encourage them you know, be, just talk to them, ask them the questions that they might have. I, they're very wise people and they would love to have a conversation with the pro providers. Yes, and you know, I think flexibility is critical. Just uh, Andy was saying when we were getting ready for the call, how uh, things are changing with the science. And so we all have to be prepared that what you know, anybody tells us now, a few months from now, we may know something a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kate, I know you've responded to some folks about questions around concerns with the children's social emotional development if the teacher's in a mask all day. And a, a number of our participants are asking questions about that. So I wonder if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I want to take a moment though. I'm going to, before I answer that, I just want to underscore something Mark said, and maybe we'll come back to it again. I think it's so important. This is, you know, these are challenging times and people feel vulnerable. And so there's strong feelings because people feel vulnerable. And um, it's really important in that situation that we just acknowledge that um, everyone needs to, you know, have places where they can seek and get support, um, ways of coping and engaging in self-care, um, and just really knowing that, you know, the work that you are doing and the support that you're providing kids is absolutely foundational and fundamental, and yet you also deserve support and nurture and care and appreciation for all that you're doing to help kids. So I, I just really hope that we have some space to make sure we talk about, you know, the early um, childhood educators in this and um, how they're feeling about all this and how important the role is and how important the self-care is. So that's one. Two, I know it comes up very often. People ask, you know, um, about young kids and um, not being able to see, you know, their caregivers' faces and what's the impact of that. And I think there's no doubt that, you know, the bottom half of our face does a lot to communicate emotion. We, you know, we convey a lot through our, um, through our mouths and um, our expressions. Um, and, you know, th that that is, of course, important. And the good news is that for most of these kids, masks are not going to be the only faces that they see during their day. They'll go home and they're going to have lots of enriching interactions with other people who are in their pod, in their bubble, who aren't having to wear masks all the time. So they'll still have that developmental opportunity to learn about facial expressions and to sort of see that and to engage. Um, and in other settings where wearing masks is really how we are helpers, how we keep safe and what we need to do, we need to remind ourselves that there are a lot of different ways that we show emotion. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we connect. So that's always true. It's just that we're so used often to sort of looking here that we don't realize that we're also responding to the tone of voice, to whatever touch, to the sounds, to the crinkle of the eyes, to the eyebrows. I remember a little kid once saying to me, you have angry eyebrows. That was before COVID, <laughs> okay? That's just like really concrete little kids sort of making sense of emotion, linking it to something in a facial feature and it wasn't the mouth. So all those different things that we do are really, really important for helping kids have those emotional communications. Our words, our tone of voice, our touch, our um, the content, all of that is still going to be in our eyes um, and convey a lot. So I actually feel pretty confident that kids are going to adapt and do really well. I would encourage also the parents, it, you know, in showing that video, I think one of the really important things that um, teachers can do is offer ideas and resources to parents. And you know, you are oftentimes the people they just trust the most. I would say, you know, pediatricians and teachers, that's who parents want information from. So sharing resources like those kinds of videos in Sesame Street or helping parents to sort of think about playing games where you, you know, maybe have a mask and you try and guess one another's emotions in the family where it's safe to take masks off and you play games about what am I, you know, what's my face feeling? If they can sort of show feelings with um, are really nice mastery opportunities and things families can do to help fit kids feel more comfortable um, through this through this experience. So just a few ideas there. And I just want to jump in. I love everything that Kate said. Um, and I just want to underscore that children are really smart. They are, they are smart, they are resilient, and they are hardwired for social communication. Like they will pop out of the womb ready to interact and engage with the world around them. And they are so clever about finding ways to interact with the world around them, even in the midst of a world that is rapidly changing. And just as a case in point, I was in clinic the other day and I am fully masked. All you can see are my eyes and there's a baby on the mother's lap. And this baby is engaging with me across the room, um, looking and focusing on my facial expression my affect communicated just through my eyes. 
And so young children are really, really clever. They will, they will find a way to affectively communicate with their caregivers and with the people who make them feel safe just from the affective information they have access to. And if all they have access to are the facial expression through the eyes, through the sound of our voice and the cadence of how we are talking, the tone, the warmth, um, how paced we are. So infants, young children, preschoolers will clue in the facial expressions, the voice, the prosody, the warmth, the tone, the cadence, and all of that is um, information that they will take in to learn how to regulate their own affect and their own emotions based on how the adult is modeling for them how to regulate affect and emotion. So even though this is, we hope, a time-limited experience where we are all integrating and interacting with each other through masked faces, children um, will still take in information and will continue to grow and develop and regulate even in a non-normative um, context because Children are, are born scientists. They're little scientists in the crib and in the nursery school. And, um, and they are clever and they are resilient. And they, um, and in the context of loving, supportive relationships with their child care provider and their early education provider, they will learn how to make meaning out of all of this and integrate it in a way that is adaptive um, uh, and resilient forming for them. Yes, great, thank you. Um, Andy, can you comment a little bit? Lots of comments in the Q&A or questions about um, where we're at with the science. What do we know about transmissibility? And uh, the, what do we know about uh, viral load in young kids? Uh, uh, I will add thus far. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, what's important to remember is uh, like with many, many things, um, with disasters and other things, you know, um, a lot of the focus has been on adults because that's who initially have been sick. Um, and oftentimes children with many other things are kind of forgotten. And so I think in terms of the research and what we have, there haven't been a lot of studies that have been done in children. And the studies that have been cited and have come out have been done in other places, in other countries with much different uh, infection rates, much different social structures. And so I think uh, what we're seeing now is we don't have a lot of great studies that we can point to. Uh, but we can, like I mentioned earlier, we definitely know that the rates of infection are increasing in children. We can just see the trends over the last few months. A lot of what we saw earlier during the pandemic were when kids uh, were not in school. Many of the Head Starts, child care centers were closed. And so as things begin to open, reopen, we have a lot more businesses, restaurants that are open. I think we're going to continue to see rates uh, increasing in children. And so in terms of the science, I think what's going to be really important until we can get a, um, you know, there's talk about vaccines and the news so far has been positive, but we don't know when that's going to be. And I don't think it's going to be this fall, in my professional opinion. It's not going to be till probably at the earliest next year. So until we get to that point, we have to do what um, has been shown to work. And again, masks are one part of that. I think some of the other things are just as important. Hand washing, making sure we clean certain toys, um, physical distancing when possible. I, I know it's really hard in the childcare settings so kids like to, to you know, play with each other, mix with each other, but we're going to do really the best that we can. Uh, oftentimes I get questions about other things like toys and things like that, but we wanna do what's best. We don't wanna take away all toys for kids. So we're gonna find toys that are easy to clean, um, toys that maybe can be rotated through, throughout um, for a week or two. Um, and then put away, you know, things that, uh, toys that can be easily washed in the dishwasher. So we're looking at strategies that can make not only um, life easier for you, but, you know, toys that can be uh, easily cleaned. So there's a number of different strategies we're gonna use to help. We're all gonna pull together and 
find the things that work best in uh, childcare settings. And, you know, masks are going to play a role in this, especially for kids that are able to wear them um, in their appropriate age group. And I think if by modeling and by putting a very using positive reinforcement is going to be really important. You know, we don't want to make uh, this something punitive in kids. We want to really encourage, reward them, provide them positive feedback. That's going to be really important uh, for what we do. And I know parents understand that. When parents come into the ER hospital, you know, there are different feelings about, but all the children that are uh, able to, all the parents, they're wearing masks and they understand that it's really important. And I think realizing that, hey, it not only protects my kid, but it protects you as a provider, it protects other children, it protects other vulnerable people. It's going to be really important. So I think the idea that we are all in this together uh, is something that we're going to have to really remember. Uh, Andy, could and maybe I missed it, I apologize. I'm trying to also uh, look at the Q&A, but um, the recent study that came out indicating the kids have less of a viral load, we just probably really don't know the answer to that, right? Yeah, so um, we can send out a, a couple of resources. Dr. Allison Tribble, who's an infectious, pediatric infectious disease doctor, wrote a great uh, blog recently about that study, but basically looked at, you know, if kids had higher rates of kind of evidence that they have pieces of the virus in their nose. And so that study suggested that, hey, kids do have higher viral loads. But the conclusion that we don't know is, does that actively translate to more infections and more rate of sp spread? And we don't know the answer to that. And so until we get more information, until the science is really caught up, you know, masks, again, are our best option to kind of prevent the spread of virus, which we know does occur even among kids, even among, among families. So um, again, anything that we can do to help kind of spread that. We know that, you know, you've seen pictures of a, a kid sneezing and all the different particles, are, you know, things spread through the air. And so what we try to do is, is our best. Um, and if there are ways we can kind of mitigate that spread, we're, we're gonna try that to the best of our ability. Great. And you touched on parents, Kate and Prachi touched on parents, lots of comments and questions in the Q&A about any thoughts, suggestions, resources, experiences you've had with managing, um, or I should perhaps say responding to parents who are not wearing masks and therefore will not um, encourage their children to wear masks and maybe even at some times provide a mask for the child. Any thoughts about how um, teachers can deal with that? That's a hard one. Mark, feel free to jump in as well. Well, um, you know, I've had a few of my consultants um, go to providers that um, were somewhat offended by them wearing a mask and I've just said, you just need to tell them that as the state, uh, an employee, um, I'm going to require you to wear a mask in that person's home as a child care provider. And so we're just communicating with them better, I think, um, like call them in the driveway when we arrive. Just it's, a, it's, a, it's part of our uh, licensing requirement to be um, unannounced. But if I just call them when I'm in the driveway, it's pretty much unannounced. And so just helping them understand that um, even for us, consultants are required to wear a mask. Um, and in that, I'm expecting that family to wear a mask to help protect my staff. So um, we're trying to communicate that as nicely as possible. Um, not everybody feels the same way, and uh, that's even in the childcare world. And like you said, parents. So um, I think just as best we can, uh, you know, really communicating with them with respect, but saying, listen, this is to protect all of us. Um, and for me, it's my, my staff who, who that's going to go to somebody else's house. And so um, that's the least that we can do under that scenario. So uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's how we're doing some things. Okay. I would just add, I think one of the things that, you know, can be helpful about regulations and rules is that, you know, the early um, care 
and education providers have that to fall back on that, you know, they do in order to keep their business afloat need to follow rules and regulations and need families to be on board with that as part of, you know, the safe opening of childcare. So that's important. One thing that I would add to that is that I think people do have really strong feelings right now in lots of different ways. This is a hard time. And I do think, you know, that some empathy for the fact that maybe not everyone feels the same way. That's, and that's okay. At the end of the day, people, you know, have their sort of own feelings about this and people have very strong feelings about all sorts of things that are happening right now. Um, whether it's about mask wearing or about losses that they've experienced in their family, about people that they're worried about in their family. You know, there's just a lot going on. So to the extent that we can be kind to one another, be empathetic to the feelings that people are having, and to see it as, you know, this is hard and we may not all see it the same way, but we'll get through this together. Um, and in the service of keeping my child care open for your child, which I really want to do, this is something that we need to do right now. Um, Mark, some questions and comments about um, the age recommendations. And um, if you could maybe perhaps comment a little bit about that on in the recent executive orders. So in that chart, it basically says they um, should be encouraged for um, a, what's it, two to 11, basically under two, um, they shouldn't be wearing them. And so we're just trying to be respectful in that process. You know, we have um, done our work with all of the DHHS folks, CBC folks, the pediatricians. Um, so we're strongly encouraging them to use them. And uh, like you've talked today, there has to be some flexibility. There has to be, there are instances where it's very difficult to do that. So I think uh, my consultants are, are able to hear and listen to issues that are there. Um, and the chart that we have in the guidelines is, is there are required portions, but there are others that are strongly encouraged. And so we will work with providers. We're trying to figure out ways to really to keep every, the kids safe and, and everybody else safe in licensed child care. And I got to give a shout out to providers because we've had very, very few, um, you know, COVID-19 cases in child care in Michigan. Now that's astounding when you think about 8,500 licensed providers and we have capacity for 350,000 children. And so, um, who else can say that? There's very few people. And so the providers, they just need a high five. Um, and they, we need to work our way through this. And um, like all of you have been saying, everything isn't perfectly right on a, in our, our piece of paper right now in the guidelines, but we're really trying to find the best guidance possible. Um, Kate, I think a really important question has come in. Um, how do we help uh, young children who perhaps become very anxious when somebody asks them to put something over their face? So that's, that is really important. And there are probably a lot of um, different reactions that kids will have based on who they are and their unique experiences and feelings and bodies. And um, I think the first thing is to really just accept how they feel and how they react, to really let them know that you are there um, and to provide comfort and reassurance, to you know, let them know you're okay, I'm here, um, and maybe to try and understand some of what it is, you know, being curious, like you're, you're feeling sad. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that um, we want to show them love, you know, we want to provide that nurture, that comfort to be with. Um, and then we want to offer hope and um, playfulness and ways of building up mastery in a sense of, I can do this. So some of the things that I was talking about before, watching fun clips, singing fun songs, working with the parents to sort of have ways that kids can play in mastery sort of based ways with masks to decorate them, as Dr. Andy was saying, um, as Dr. Prachi was saying, really sort of helping them make sense of it in a way that it's about keeping safe. Um, 
and you know really sort of take the time to invest in helping them to feel more comfortable i've seen so many great things online you know fun songs that kids can sing um, maybe drawing pictures of superheroes how they can be helpers um, maybe making a special book for themselves about putting it on but it is important to be curious and find out what it is that they're worried about if they're worried like i won't be able to breathe you know then you need to really offer reassurance about being able to breathe and just practice it um, with them in a way that's reassuring. So, so figuring out what it is that they're feeling, offering them acceptance, comfort, love, playfulness and mastery and uh, hope and a belief that they will be able to, to work through that to become uh, a superhero helper themselves. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, can I, to, can I say um, To build oh, on, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. Oh, I just wanted to say, you know, one of the advantages we have in the state of Michigan is compared to some of the other states, which is fortunate, unfortunately for other states, is that we are still in an area, I think we're a little bit ahead of the game, meaning we have a chance to do something about this. Um, I have a lot of other colleagues in other states where if you look at the childcare system, they are in crisis. Um, if you look at Kentucky, uh, Texas, Carolinas, many of the childcare centers are closing or closed because of the dramatic increase in the number of cases. So I, I think uh, doing this now and thinking about it now and talking about it now is really, really important. You can really, if you just Google the news in terms of childcare and COVID, they are literally closing and um, are struggling. So from a Michigan standpoint, you know, I really care about child care, child care system in Michigan. You guys do an outstanding job. So doing this ahead of time, doing putting these places before the fall and winter is gonna be really, really important for not only children's place to stay, but for the livelihood of many child care providers. So I really do think we have the benefit of staying ahead of this proactively. Um, so I think it's gonna be really important that we all work together. And again, as Mark said, um, for right now, I think the cases are low and you guys are doing an amazing job. So I want you know, and to encourage everyone, you know, keep it up. I, I think you know, it's, it's, a, it's proud saying that, hey, Michigan, we're, we're doing something right. And I just wanted to add to what, um, I absolutely agree with everything Andy and Mark was, um, were saying. And I wanted to just add to what Kate was saying about little children who may feel anxious and to recognize that this is not um, one and done, that this is a process and, and that this is a process of mastery and to that basically we meet them where they are and we journey with them. And so little kids are so great about playing out their hopes, their dreams, their fears, their anxieties through play. And so great to bring a little teddy bear or a little doll with the mask and let the child sort of play out where the anxiety is coming from. And then if there are, um, and then to be able to say, okay, well, you know, maybe we're not ready to wear a mask, you know, today. Maybe we can try for, you know, one minute or 10 seconds. And then we build up that um, process of tolerance and that process of comfort and that process of mastery and to recognize that you know even the modeling of other young children who are also being helpers to their peers to say oh I know you're scared but it's really not that bad it's kind of comfy and even the feedback from their fellow classmates can be empowering and helpful um, and facilitative for, for little children to get over their sense of fear and to develop a sense of um, uh, to help rewrite the narrative that's in their mind and develop a sense of resilience. Um, Andy, can you just one more time, because there's still lots of comments, um, reassure us that uh, children and adults wearing masks all day are safe. Yeah, sure. I, I think, um, you know, uh, Looking at the, the, again, from based on personal experience, and I'm sure um, Dr. K and Dr. Fauci can agree with me, we see a lot of kids that have to wear masks. Um, we have kids that have to wear masks for long periods of time, and they, they have other medical issues and, and do quite, they do well. And so I want to reassure folks that, you know, wearing masks is safe. I also uh, think it's important to remember that by doing so, you're really protecting a lot of important people um, 
uh, that you come in contact with, you know, and anything that we can do to help kind of mitigate the spread of, you know, COVID-19 is going to be important. Um, I know that a, a big question that comes around uh, is about asthma. And one of the things I have to say is, you know, I have kids with asthma, with a history of asthma, that do fine with wearing masks. I do think it's important to, for a, a child who has a history of asthma is to make sure they're really connected with their pediatrician, have a great asthma action plan, uh, making sure their asthma is under control. And then there may be situations where if your asthma is really flaring up, uh, you're having coughing, maybe you do need to be at home um, instead of being in the child care center. But there are treatments for that. But masks can be safely worn even in kids with asthma who aren't actively having symptoms. And if they are, they do, do need to follow their asthma action plan, uh, talk to their pediatrician, and, and seek the appropriate treatments. But again, that, that's a question I get asked a lot. And yes, I personally have asthma and I, I wear a mask for many, many hours while in the hospital and is a very safe thing to do. Great, thank you. Well, we are out of time and there are so many great questions and, and comments in the Q&A and, and we will be collating those. Um, I'm not gonna guarantee that we can answer every single question, but many of them have a similar thing theme and we'll share the ones that are relevant to the guidelines uh, with Mark and then. I'm sure he'll be happy to provide some answers as well. So I want to thank all of you um, for your time today. Um, can't say enough about uh, the great work you're doing. Remember we, to take care of yourselves. The concept of put the oxygen mask on for you teachers and administrators uh, before you take care of the little people uh, is very relevant. So do take some good care of yourselves. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Rosenblum, uh, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Hashikawa, and, and Mr. Jansen. Uh, this has been a great experience, and um, uh, good luck to all of you, and keep uh, doing the great work you're doing. And thanks again for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.